Welcome to the Tomosi Business Training Series. The basis of these sessions is to support the Tomosi Group staff and management to raise their capabilities and performance. The series is also a platform to share our experience with young entrepreneurs, making an effort to build their startups in Uganda and across Africa. Today's training session is about national unity and straightening the bonds of East Africa as our regional and African heritage. Good morning, my name is Odrek Rwabogo. I'm coming back to you after a week of the teaching we had uh, the previous week uh, to emphasize some of the things we shared about nation building, about media, and generally about collective responsibility we have as citizens to ensure that whatever each one of us does, it's like a stream, streams that join to create a lake. Now, we also know that King Rumanika there was a connection between King Rumanika and King Mtesa. The succession battle in Karagwe, which pitted Rumanika against his brother called Ruejira, the first person to send reinforcements was Mtesa. And in sending those reinforcements, I want you to remember you listening or watching me that a number of those people didn't return. They settle, they create homes in what you call Tanzania today, but they are from Buganda, as I will demonstrate later. This gentleman, uh, Rumanika, um, has even a much deeper um, uh, contact, influence, around northern Tanzania and Nkore and Unyoro because we know that when the kingdoms, when the British took Nkore, a lot of the people who ran to Karagwe, their grandchildren returned with names. In my area, there, there used to be a man called there was a man called Chitomomo, Chitomomo, Chitomomo. The word Chitomomo is not a Runyankore word. We couldn't find it in Runyankore, in Nyachitara, until I asked older people and they told me that a Chitomomo means something that is calm, and it is a Runyambo word. We also had names like Mutembeya, Mutembeya. Mutembeya is not a Chinyankore name, this Mutembeya was the father of some of the founders of the NRM. In the 70s, you hear stories of some of the people who died in Bali. This was their father. Mutembeya is from Kutembeya. Kutembeya is trade. It's a Runyambo word, Runyambo Swahili word. So you can see, today we still do Kutembeya. You see the connectivity of our countries. But the point I'm really trying to make is that However way each of these kings reacted, this one would stop, King Rabujiri would stop any trade in his country so that he does not get external influences. He only allowed a group of people, I found out this name, he allowed a group, a group of people who were East Africans and their name, they termed them Vasumbwe, Vasumbwe. Basumbwe. And Basumbwe, a majority were Nyamwezis and Baganda. Where are the Nyamwezis? In Tanzania. Where are the Baganda? In Uganda. He would allow them only if they paid uh, homage to his court, but he would disallow Arabs, he would disallow Europeans to trade in his kingdom. The point is, however way these four kings reacted, it later shaped the kind of country we would have. The similarities are the first contact with the West. The second one, alternative way to build an economy because the economies of these little kingdoms were based on raiding. You go and raid X's land, you steal cows, or you steal goats, or you take children who you conscript in the army. This was the way the economy of the time was. But because of the first contact with the world by these four kings, they um, started to build alternative ways of the economy, which is called trading. Trading replaced raiding. Trading replaced raiding. And if you want to heal a country and to grow its economy, you trade. And 
you know, we know that, for example, the cu first currency that removed butter, buttering goods and services, the first currency were Kauri shells. They came from the coast by this man who came in 1841, who would later end up in Buhaya. Buhaya, the higher people are here, somewhere uh, northwestern Tanzania on Lake Victoria. He established camp here. This is where he died. This Ibn Mohammed, and he introduced Kauri shells as the first currency. Uh, and the exchange was you bring cloth, we give you elephant tusks. So that's number two that they did. Number three, each one of them tried to resist, in, resist or collaborate to save their kingdoms without knowing that the greater fight is above them, is in Europe. The final thing they share is that the first intra-East African movements beyond small communities. Now, let me demonstrate one thing here that I find very interesting. In the year 1904, we found that there was a group that left this part here and went to Karagwe, right? And left Karagwe and went to a place here called Jisaka. And in this place, Jisaka, these were a hundred Baganda men. They, they, were, they went by trading, they went by caravan, they went by taking goods that had come from the coast right here or from Dar es Salaam right into Uganda. The trade routes were in that way. So this group of 100 men crisscross and in Gisaka and they find a prince who was fighting to take the northern part of Rwanda. That prince was called Rukura. The word Rukura is Kukura or Kujayechi into Nochija Mutaka. The words are similar. This Rukura organized them to attack King Msinga of Rwanda, who had taken over from Ruawujiri, who died in uh, 1895. And these men never left. How did they end there? They ended there by looking for an opportunity. Even in, in the period of feudalism, people were still looking for opportunity. Now, so if people would leave Buganda and end up in Rwanda, it means that the coastal Swahili people started to come into the central parts of East Africa. The Nyamwezis, who were largely caravan raiders, they would be porters, they would be the one bringing kauri shells. Some of those Nyamwezis were assimilated in Buganda, in Nkore, in Toro, but they don't have Nyamwezi names anymore. Just as much the 100 Baganda boys who fought with Rukura have Chinyarwanda names. They will never come back. They are part of the interplay of the fabric that makes us East Africans. Now, many of us know who are interested in history that in the year 1889, there was religious uh, conflict in Uganda because the Anglicans were fighting with the Catholics for the control of Mengo. The Catholics were banished by Lugard to Masaka, present day Masaka in Ubudu. The Muslims were banished to Butambara, allowing the Anglicans to keep, to take control and keep in Buganda, in Mengo. What happened in the year 1889 is that those who were forced out of religious fights, a group of them settled in present day Mawogola, which is in Sembabule, in Uwera, and that settlement right there had two important effects. The first one is that a young man called Mbaguta, who had been born around Liantonde area, he would create a force out of, he would, the king of Nkore would give a home to these Christians running away. But instead of keeping them idle, using Mbaguta, who I will let us speak about in future, created a force out of them, and it is that force that extended the borders of Nkore to Shema, present-day Shema, present-day Igara. That, this is effect one. 
religious refugees create a force they are used to expand another kingdom. They are grandchildren, great grandchildren live in Nkore. I don't have time to tell you in Weju, the people I know, in uh, Ibanda, in main in Barara, people who come from that background. Now, for the Catholics, because they had been chased out of Buganda and settled in Masaka, Monsignor Jean Joseph Heath, I think that's the name, used Masaka as a base and about 1901, uh, he sent a contingent to the kingdom of Rwanda and settled at a place called Rwaza. That's how the Catholic influence, French Catholic influence started in Rwanda. The base was Masaka. A couple of years later, the Anglicans hear that the French Catholics are strong in Rwanda. They also establish their own outpost in a place called Gahini. Gahini is the source of the East African Christian revival movement where people left Gahini, they would preach in Kabare, in Barara, and in the year 1929. A young medical doctor from Britain called Dr. John Church met with a young man called John Nagenda. And out of this, he would challenge traditional Anglicanism and creates the Born Again movement. Uh, what we call East African Christian Revival Movement. That's why when you are in Western Kenya, in Kisumu, you can sing to Kutendeleze, and people will sing with you. When you are in Northern Tanzania, to Kutendeleze works. When you are in Winyoro, when you are in Rwanda, Burundi, to Kutendeleze works. So, therefore, really what I'm trying to say is that if you get these four things that these kings confronted, if you get the cross-border movements and add the building of the Uganda Railway in 1896 from Mombasa eventually to Kasese, now you are introducing another group called the Indians from Gujarati. You had Arabs, Muslims at the border coming as traders. You have Christians coming as either Catholics or Anglicans. Now you have Indians building a railway line. You have East African Christian revival movement later in the middle of the 20th century that comes out of that. What happens is just a panoply, an interplay of unity around trade, around movements, around religion. Around, so tribe becomes less and less of a base. What happens now is that you're trying to build a supra Great Lakes region at that time unknowingly. So today we're trying to build East Africa, but really the seeds were planted unknowingly by these four kings and their generation um, at the time. Now, when you add over all these, you have a sense of early integration. You have cross-border movements. You have cross-pollination of ideas and people that what you call a tribe now and reliance on a tribe to determine your place in the world is shallow, extremely shallow. Your focus should now not be on displacing your neighbor and saying that person who is that tribe that is in the constitution that is called Banyarwanda, like I heard the young man say, should return. Basically, you don't know who you are returning. You could be returning yourself because just as much as there are Ugandans here, there are people from Uganda who are Rwandans on that side. And so it is in Kenya, and so it is in Tanzania, if it were not for the artificial borders at the end of colonialism in the uh, 60s. Eh? Now, the thing we should be dealing with is not to displace our neighbor or to stereotype our neighbor or to be quiet about people doing it. The thing we should be doing is to deal with the threats that are supra above us. Let me give you an example. Last week, I read a story that the EU, European community, had said anybody vaccinated with AstraZeneca made in India cannot enter Europe. Count yourself not vaccinated. What are they trying to do? The whole of Uganda, one million people, are vaccinated with AstraZeneca from India. So are many parts of Africa. 
they are trying to tell you we are the biggest threat, not your tribes. Because whether you push your neighbor away, you will not push away corona unless you rely on science. Unless you create a new tribe called research. You create a new tribe called science. Uniting around those things to defeat the external enemy is the best way to protect a tribe and its customs. We got to be careful ostracizing people simply because of where they come from, because in their blood we are there. In our blood they are there. We are the same people. I thank you. God bless you. This concludes part two of our session. Please look forward to part three next week. We would like to hear from you. Please email us at info at tapmedia.com and visit our website at www.tapmedia.com. You can also visit our offices located at Tomosi Business Park, Luzira, Port Bell Road, or call 0414-220-702. Thank you.